support Narrative's independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative and check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe and download. did you leave? Why did you, you and Eric decide to do some part ways? He came to me in early 2015 and he wanted to uh, do some peer mercenary work in Oscar the Uh It was uh, both uh, aviation and ground forces, so he's going to bring in the South African mercenaries on the ground. Serge was going to set up an air component, and uh, the Oscar the was going to go after the Army. Uh, kind of an old type of thing. Uh, and I told Eric at that point, I said, there is no way in hell we can do that at Frontier Services School. And he says, well, I still want to do it. I said, fine, do it outside of uh, Frontier Services Group. He said, fine, I will. It comes down to these aircraft that you've probably read about, the two thrush crop-dust aircraft that I thought had been turned into ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. They actually been turned into light attack at that under my watch. So I said, Eric, this is complete bullshit. You weaponize this aircraft, you get it behind my back. And, you didn't know at you know, all that they were doing it, at all? Well, no, because I thought they were at a factory being outfitted, outfitted with um, ISR equipment. Oh, wow. That was that's um, a shocking. I start getting, when I start getting pictures, you know, this was him and Serge again, a guy named Sean Matthews. Uh, <laughs> I start getting pictures of, you know, these light attack aircraft. I'm like, well, those can't be ours because we don't have light attack aircraft. And uh, huh. this Greenlee guy that was working on the uh, Project Johnson John, he goes, Greg, those are your aircraft. As a matter of fact, Eric has offered to sell me not just two of them, but eight of them. Hmm. <laughs> so I confronted Eric. I took it to the board of directors. Admiral Fallon and I were both in sense. We're like, what the fuck? Um, and, uh, you know, so eventually we had a board meeting in March of 2016. So for two days, I went hammer and tongs through probably 300 pages of documents that our, our uh, legal counsel had produced, reports they'd produced. And I said, Eric, I believe we've probably violated U.S. laws. Mm-hmm. We, the company, we use an individual violated U.S. laws, and I'm going to the Department of State and I'm reporting it. Eric lost his mind. Um, Which year was this, by the way? What's that? What year was this? This was 2016. Okay. Uh, oddity fired. Um, that wasn't going to happen. It was just too weird of a situation. But I was ready to resign because I just couldn't live within a company that did that. So mm-hmm. I'm ready to do this board meeting. We'd already had two days in this. So for 15 hours and 30 minutes, Eric and I had been going at each other in a board meeting. And I have a father looking at us and, you know, we're like, oh, shit. Um, and then at the end of this board meeting, uh, our Chinese uh, benefactors from CIDIC, uh, Chinese Communist Party members, stand up. And they say, well, this is all nice, Greg. You and Eric, you know, thank you for all the work you've done. But we have something we'd like to announce. So Lao Ning stands up. He's our CIDIC board member, Chinese Communist Party member. And he says, going forward, uh, Frontier Services Group is going to be CIDIC. It's going to be Air Prince. It's going to provide security work. And it's going to provide security work for Belt Road. So I'm, I'm literally sitting right next to you oh, know wow. former second commander at the Fallon. And I look, I look at him, and I look at Lao Ning and Dr. Cody, two vice chairman, Erickson next to me, and I simply say, well, then I'm fucking resigning right now. And I'm wow. looks at me and goes, resigning with Greg. And that was how I left Frontier Service. Wow. So you had no idea that this was the plan? No, no. And, you know, what's interesting is because Eric and Dorian Barak and Johnson Co., these names may not mean anything. Yeah, right now, but some of those a little carefully in, in a second. But uh, go ahead. Uh, these guys have been running back. So while I'm preparing the report, it's a law from Kingman's Hall in Washington, D.C. that says Frontier Services Group and possibly Air Prince itself has have violated ITAR laws. Mm-hmm. I'm still mad. At the same time, what are the I, just uh, what are the ITAR laws again? Well, it's it's uh, well, the ITAR laws are uh, uh, exporting defense articles. Mm-hmm. Okay. Defense you need a license, Inclu- including defense services. 
Yes. Right. Okay. So, well, I didn't have a report going on that. Paid a million dollars for the report from the law firm. Eric, Eric's guys, Johnson Cole and Dorian Barak were running back and forth to Beijing. I'm like, what the hell's going on? So that's what was going on. Hmm. So, you know, while I thought I was making this great presentation to our board saying, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be doing that. They were all okay um, with you breaking the law. Well, yeah, they didn't give a shit. They, right. The board did not care if we were breaking U.S. laws or not. I, I think that they, I think the Chinese were playing the long game with us. And when they hmm. brought their parents in, uh, I think their intention was to learn how to do private security contractors. So let's talk a little bit about the Chinese, because I mean, this is, a, you know, most people understand that uh, Eric Prince is a mercenary. Most people understand that he's involved in Blackwater. They even might be some understanding that he's worked with the UAE, creating private armies, maybe he's even worked with the Saudis. It's a whole different thing when you're talking about China. You're talking about, you know, our biggest adversary on the planet and the things that they're doing in support of their foreign policy, the Frontier Services Group is doing in support of their foreign policy, including things that you know, exploiting Africa, building Uyghur camps, um, you know, figuring out surveillance uh, technology, all those kinds of things that are just you know sort of anti-American in some ways. Um, how did how did this come to be that you guys started working for China? You're killing me, Doug. Um, I'm running out of I'm running out of my piss and vinegar, but I'll, I'll read yes. it. Um, so what happened is in 2011, 2012, Eric was really focused on his uh, private equity from Frontier Resource Group. Right. And, um, some of the investments were not going that well. He had a cement uh, distribution business in uh, oh, Honduras. Sorry, c- cement. Yeah. So, so uh, let me digress just slightly for Eric. So what we would what we would do was I was part of this is we would import from Portugal bag cements in 100 pound bags. Mm-hmm. And then you would take a little kiosk in Kinshasa and sell those and they would sell them out. So you could sell shitloads of that, but you couldn't sell it very profitably. So that business didn't go well, as you can guess. Uh, so importing cement bags into the DRC wasn't going that well. And the um, oil refinery in the South Sudan, because they're in the middle of the Civil War, that wasn't going that well either. Uh, so Eric was running out of money. He partnered with Sheikh Taknoon, who we should talk about later, possibly too, from the Emirates. Um, and Sheikh Taknoon was withdrawn from the partnership. So we thought we had a half million dollars of capital lined up. We really only had Eric's 50 million of capital lined up. And we'd lost at least 20 million of that on the two investments I just talked about. So a good friend of mine came to me and said, Hey, Greg, I know some investors that might want to invest with you, but they're in Hong Kong. I'm like, damn it, let's get on a flight to Hong Kong. So we did. And we ran into uh, we introduced a guy named Johnson Co. And uh, Johnson uh, started introducing us to we go to Beijing and Shanghai. And then all of a sudden we started getting introduced to Communist Party members and other big mm. wigs. And they say, you know what, Eric, we don't want to invest in Frontier Resource Group, but we would really be happy to invest with you in a Blackwater Two concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I sit at the dinner in Beijing going, well, we can't do that. I mean, Eric Prince got mm-hmm. good security. Chinese, but what we could do is we could set up a logistics business. So we could do everything Blackwater used to do. And they were really good at moving stuff around. They had 73 aircraft. I said, we could do that for you guys. And they said, great, let's do that. And what we did is we just did a reverse merger. Eric sold a company he owned in um, Mombasa, Kenya. Uh, he paid about a quarter million dollars for it. He sold them for three and a half million dollars 24 hours later. Uh, we did a reverse merger into a public shell. Public Shell's only asset was 110 million USD in cash. So now we have this thing, we have 110 million in cash. We've got an airstrip in Mombasa, Kenya, and we've got a Chinese partner, Citic. And Citic is not just your typical, like, sort of, you know, sort of your consumer bank. Citic is basically Xi's bank. You know, it, it, it could not be any closer to the top of the Communist Party food chain than Citic is. I mean, uh, Jean uh, Jinping, who I think this is what you see over here. Um, I mean, this guy is is super close to G. They're personal friends, but more than super close, they also Citic basically funds everything that uh, the Communist Party wants, the Central Committee wants, with the it's the Belt and Union or whatever it's called, or or anything in Africa. This Citic is who they go to. So it's you know you're going to the heart of it. Oh, tip of the spear. For the Chinese government. 
Yeah. And like, we had to go get the approval to get this reverse parker into uh, this public shell. Eric and I, his buddy Chris Burgess, one of his uh, buddies from uh, Buck 188 that runs Greystone Forum, and three or four other of us, we have to go to Beijing. We go to Cynic offices, and I've met with heads of state. I've met with important people. I've met with chairmen of companies. Mm-hmm. It was like being with a goddamn king. So, yeah. I mean, the problem circumstance around um, the Cynic chairman, now the CEO of Financial Services Group, blessing uh, this uh, Eric Prince to invest in the Chinese, it was pretty amazing. So you do the math and you've got, you know, Eric Prince was an advisor for Donald Trump during the election of 2016 and was a, um, a, a big donor to the campaign and apparently was also a big enough shot in the campaign to, to go as an emissary to the Seychelles to negotiate the redistribution of, of power in the world with the Russians. This guy is actually working for the Chinese? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's really a mess, guys. <laughs> and it's uh, it's stunning, really. And I think you know, I've absorbed this a little bit because I've we've had this conversation before, Greg. But most Americans who are voting for Donald Trump think he's anti-Chinese, and they do not believe that one of his closest associates is a is a pro. Uh, I don't know, pro. He works for the Chinese. There's not even he's directly he's bankrolled by the Chinese. It would be yeah. shocking to most people. Whose sister is in his cabinet? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Um, and this is part of the, the arc of what Eric has learned over the last 15 years. Of you know, since 2007, he has not been able to. A little bit like Donald Trump. The reason Donald Trump had to go to Deutsche Bank, right? Mm-hmm. Eric, it's hard for him to do business legitimately out in the open. So people don't want to necessarily be associated with him. Um, you know, Khalifa Haftar does, but other people may, may not. So it's really, a good what, list. Yeah. So, uh, so it, what he does is he throws a flag. So when he comes to the U.S., he is rah, 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 you know, screw this, you know, I'm pro-American, I'm all that. Well, when he's in China, and I've been there with him a dozen occasions, more than that between Hong Kong and uh, Beijing probably, uh, and Shanghai, uh, he is worshipped over there. They love him. Hmm. I'm sure they, they do. do. I mean, he comes they with the American know-how, uh, technology from Israel. We'll talk about that in a bit. And he uh, is willing to do a lot of dirty work for them, especially when it comes to exploiting Africa. You know, I mean, it's a, it's shocking that everyone thinks that, you know, the Chinese are just doing something in Africa. They're not just doing something. They're recolonizing Africa. They're basically taking over the entire place. And it's, you know, the, the human rights abuses are legendary, the stuff they're doing with the Uyghurs. I mean, the list is endless, never mind what's going on with the coronavirus right now. Um, I mean, it does, you know, how does Eric Prince justify it to himself? Does he have a soul? Does he, you know, when he looks himself in the mirror at night, does he, can he justify this? Come on now. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't think he's really got a problem, no, because Eric is, you know, he would say he's a free market capitalist, he's a libertarian. Um, I don't think Eric has a lot of deep soul searching problems with this, you know. So he's so working for the communists? <laughs> well, this is where I'm confused. Yeah. This is where most of the people that listen to you guys or follow my Twitter feed or do anything else, they don't know people like Eric Prince. They don't know people like Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And when you do, you do know someone like one of those two individuals, and I know Eric, and, you know, I've known him for 20 years. I've, I've been to his house a hundred times. I've spent nights there. I've had a hundred dinners. But, um, he doesn't think the way you, the three of us, think. He just doesn't. You know, it's basically, it's transactional. And he believes that he is right all the time. Hmm. I want to talk about two other things before we get away from it. We are taking up a lot of time. This might have to extend into another hour if you'll let us do this on another day. But there are two things I just have to touch on. One is um, his Israeli connections, because we've spoken about this a little bit. He's, you mentioned the name Dorian uh, Barak, who is a, a well-known investment guy in, in Israel. It looks a lot to me like a hood Barak's when he was younger, but I'm just guessing a little bit there. Um, I don't think there's a relationship at all. And um, Eric is in is in business with uh, um, Dorian and a guy named Avi Harrow, who is the 
yeah, who is the former chief of staff, was the chief of staff of Netanyahu until recently. In fact, I think he testified against uh, Netanyahu. So there's Dorian and there's Ari uh, Haro and there's uh, Eric Prince. They're in business together in a company called Indigo Capital. They do a lot of good investments in, in Israel for startups, a lot of technology startups um, that, you know, you typically find uh, these kind of investment firms investing in. Now, there's a couple of them. There's one that they do a video uh, analysis on surveillance cameras. They basically check out, you know, if you've got any of these, uh, they attach AI to surveillance cameras so they can spot what people are doing and read what people are doing. They also have a voice analysis surveillance thing uh, that they've invested in. And it seems that a lot of their investments are directed to, um, or funded at least by a company called, I'm going to mess this up, but Quang Chi out of China. And then you see the CEO. Also on the board is that same Mr. Johnson that you were talking about uh, earlier on. He's on the same board of, of this company. So there's another connection there between Eric and Kong Chi. And the Chinese firm seems to be funding a lot of this Israeli technology, which looks to be like surveillance technology. Huh. I mean, that's what it, it does. That's exactly what they do. Oh, the kind of stuff does. you would use at the Uyghurs or, or someplace like that. Um, and so... How does America. this happen that he associated himself with, with Dorian Barak and Netanyahu's chief of staff? Yeah, so, I mean, I actually think the introduction was made by a uh, former 60 Minutes producer and CIA officer, Adam Shalowski, hmm. in 2010. Adam uh, worked for Eric. He's on his payroll. Um, and I think he made the introduction to Dorian. And then Dorian uh, has become, you know, I describe him as um, Eric Prince's version of Michael Cohn, just a whole lot smarter and a whole lot better at it. Mm -hmm. So Dorian uh, helps Eric invest, but he also helps him set up companies, his bank accounts, uh, helps him determine how to move funds. So, yeah, Dorian is his, uh, his version of Michael Cohn. Is that Dorian and Ari are also in business with another two entities that are really uh, make you make you go, mm, especially in the context of the, 20, um, the 2016 elections. And that is that the same guys who do the Indigo uh, venture capital firm are also part of this company called Torona. This is a British Virgin Islands company, and it is co-owned by Alexander, I'm going to mess this up, Skorobuka. So you can read it yourself. And he's not, a colleague. Not going to work here anymore. Yeah. And Mr. Poromarenko, who are both Russian oligarchs. Um, and so it looks to me like Dorian and Ari, who is Netanyahu's uh, chief of staff, are in business with some Russian oligarchs, while at the same time being in business with Eric Prince and a bunch of Chinese uh, folk buying up Israeli technology. Uh, it's, a, Sir, it's, it's a hell of a lot. the whole list of can I have the whole list of companies here? So we've we've kind of got China, Russia, UAE, Israel. They just had a great day today. They're apparently they're they're at peace. There's That's peace. great. Everyone's there's getting peace along. Going on there. Yeah. Maybe Qatar Got- is in there. It's almost like there's this kind of network of of countries that all are attacking the United States democracy that Eric Prince loves the best these days. Just a just a trend in it, trend analysis. It's the first Let's time I've seen, and you know, we've been tracking this for a long time. It's the first time we've seen all these companies and countries, let's just say, in, in business arrangements with each other, and it all seems to go through Eric Kritz. Um one guy, one guy. Greg, <laughs> any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I mean, I've discussed with some folks recently uh, when Trump and uh, Simple Jared. Um, came into power in um, early 2017, they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, On the other hand, Eric had just spent 15 years making all these relationships, connections. So Mm. I think I'm not Eric. And I think that Eric probably plays a much more prominent role than people can imagine with this administration. And, Mm. um, you know, tight with Pompeo, um, you know, people will duck for cover uh, when you mention Eric Prince, they won't talk about him, but I think he's quietly uh, gotten most things he's wanted, except, you know, his Afghanistan, American East Indy, Indian co- East Indy company. Other than that, he's got whatever he's wanted. So when you say he's hmm. tight with the administration, I mean, that's, um, 
is he is he operating like a, a black ops kind of thing for them? Is he um, is he a dirty tricks guy for them? What what kind of role does he play with the administration? I I don't know. I don't know exactly what he's doing. I do know that a lot of the fingerprints I've seen around the world look like Eric's fingerprints, but I don't know that I could prove that they are. But you got one of Eric's closest friends, a guy I spent 45 minutes talking to at Eric's wedding reception is Ollie North. Um, seems like Ollie did this 30 years ago. It does seem like there's a lot of resonance there between Oliver North and, and, and Eric, but it just seems like a, you know, they seem like they've operated in similar ways. Um, and, and still being, you know, some some people, you know, great patriots. Uh, there's also the issue of Zamal and, and Sai Group. This is a, a, a very important company that was involved in the surveillance uh, and manipulation of uh, data during the Trump election. And there was a very famous meeting that happened August the 3rd of 2016. And it was uh, Eric Prince who organized that meeting. And it, it, he took Joel Zarmel, who was the social media manipulation expert. He had an expert called George Nader, who was representative of the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Israel, although that wasn't as obvious. You mean, and, you mean the convicted child uh, that, sex abuser? Uh, yeah. That same guy. And it was a meeting with Donald Trump Jr. And they went to, to, to pitch them on this idea. Stephen Miller was there as well uh, on this on this idea that they were going to manipulate the electorate in terms of social media sentiment during the 2016 election. And they were going to do it on behalf of, um, of the Trump campaign, but paid for by the Saudis and the UAE uh, crowd. Do you, do you, are you, you're, you're familiar with this meeting with Cy Group, presumably? Well, yeah, I've read about it, so I'm familiar with it. Yeah, it's probably this. So when we were talking earlier, you, you surprised me when you said that Joel Zarmel and Eric Prince go back to, when, when was it? When did they first meet? Oh, I, I think it was when Cheney was still in office. I think I told you 2010. Mm -hmm. so I thought it was back in 2008. 2008? Wow. Zarmel, for those people who aren't familiar, is, is really kind of a, he comes out of 8200, the big intelligence unit in Israel. Um, there's another a former chief of staff of Netanyahu sitting on his board. I mean, this is a very intelligence-connected, IDF-connected uh, company that did all this work to, to help Trump get elected. Uh, and certainly not in any of the volumes I've read. I read volume five today, double-checked it. I read the Mueller report today. The earliest they can place Eric Prince and, uh, and Zarmel together is 2015. You're saying it predates that by five years. Yes. Yeah. That's the earliest connection between any of the key players in Trump Russia, call it what you will, that we have been able to determine. I've not seen a previous connection to, to 2015. And you're saying it started, some sort of connection happened there in 2010. It started with Wiki Strats, yeah. Mm. So it started well. Mm. Mm -mm. One thing about what you just described, the effort that they made on social media. So it's probably not illegal unless it's funded by the Saudis, the Emiratis, and other folks, right? So let's put that aside. So what they're doing, it's where do the funds come from? However, what I will tell you is I used to sit in Eric's villa in Abu Dhabi with two former uh, CIA officers, and they were spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to do that exact same program on the Iranians. So now, hmm. you know, I, I, I sat here just shocked that what we were talking about in, say, 2013 in Abu Dhabi, how you could turn that on the Iranians, use social media to create a civil unrest or influence things. Mm -hmm. Eric is now working with the Israelis on, on an American election. I'm like, are you, come on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's incredibly suspicious. I mean, they did, in fact, I think, still try to do that same thing with side group. In 2017, once they were elected, they did try to use the same technology on the Iranians. So, you know, they, they did a test run maybe with Trump. It seemed to work quite well. And then off they went <laughs> to do and did Iran. I mean, the question is, who paid for this? There was a conversation about money being transferred. It was about uh, 5 to $10 million that they were charging. And then Eric Prince actually turned to NATO and he said, you guys should pay for this. 
And in fact, $1 million or thereabouts, it did get transferred. And then they said there wasn't any work done, but it seems like the work was paid for. So if that in fact happened in front of Donald Trump Jr., you would think that there would be evidence that they had uh, committed some sort of meddling or or, or something of that sort uh, that would be illegal. Look, XAML was already financed by Oleg Deripaska and Dmitry Revolvlev. We had previous oh. uh, arrangements with those two. He had, uh, you know, they had hired him before. Both uh, Revolvlev and uh, Deripaska had hired him for different projects in 2016. I get the sense that that was a bit of them kicking the tires uh, on XAML's company and seeing whether it would be the right thing for them. Uh, so they sort of test ran him on a couple of projects. But he's a front. He's a front for other countries, nation state intelligence services. I'm sorry. These guys are not single operators with this some genius technology on manipulating elections. This is shit that Russians have been doing for 100 years. And they're the ones who put this up. And that's who Eric Prince has introduced us to. And that's who's working with Trump. Yeah, it sure looks like that's the case to me. I mean, Greg, do you think that's the, that's what's going on here? That we do we have a multinational effort to uh, to elect a president? Is that what happened here in 2016? I, I believe it's just my belief. I have no physical evidence whatsoever that Eric was working with the Emiratis and the Israelis on when he was working with Al. Mm-hmm. So, by definition, what you just described. That's my belief. Wow. I'm going to throw up one last slide and then we, we can wrap it up for today. But there's a, uh, here's Eric Prince in the middle of all of this, uh, of these nice faces you see around here. Uh, the ones in blue, they're all Israeli uh, operatives. I've introduced you to, to the two of them that belong to the Indigo Group. There's also Joel Zamel, he's at the very top there. And then there's um, Lital Lashem, who's a, who works with Eric Prince directly in one of the companies that he, that he is a manager of. And she works for him, but she also seems to have very, very close connections to the IDF's uh, world over there. So there's four people directly linked, maybe five if you take Nader as well, linked to Netanyahu. So Eric Prince's ties to Israel are pretty strong when you look at this chart. We're aware that he's got strong ties to Donald Trump. If you look at all the red uh, outlines, you know, uh, DeVos's sister, of course, Donald Trump Jr. We just described that meeting. He's been very close to Michael Pence since who knows when, long, long time ago, because they were both part of that Christian national policy group. And then he's been close to Stephen Bannon, uh, at least through the 2016-20 and, and onwards campaign. And then you've got Xi, uh, the Chinese premier over there, uh, and his two connections, Johnson and Zhang, which we've spoken about. And finally, there's MBZ, the crown prince of, uh, of UAE. And he's, of course, very tied to, to Eric Prince, as we've been describing, because he worked for for the crown prince for a long period of time and i've looked at these charts for a very long time i spent a lot of time looking at, at these charts and other charts like this it's very rare for me to see someone connected to all these parties is there are very many people in the trump russia world that connect with Netanyahu, that connect with trump mbz and with china so you need to see that eric prince might style himself as someone who's a who's a sideline player but he might be a very very central figure in the election and manipulation of the election to install Donald Trump. Even if he is not overtly a central figure, he is covertly a central figure. And he's working behind the scenes very, very actively, internationally and domestically. Support Narrative's independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative and check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to subscribe and download.